Hello, my quilting friends. My name is Leah Day, and welcome to episode 93 of the podcast. And today I'm chatting with Beth Moore Collins about fixing your quilts that are just not working out quite right. And Beth has a lot of experience with this. She is an artist and has tons of experience with kind of the design and color aspect of art. And she applies that to her quilts now and has lots of cool ideas for fixing it whenever you run into snags and run into problems. Uh, you know, whether it's taking a break from the quilt for a little while, or it's cutting it apart and putting it back together again in a different way. I hope that you enjoyed this podcast episode and learn more from Beth. So that is what's coming up in the interview later on halfway through the podcast, but I always start my show with a little bit of the news about what's going on around the house and what I'm really working on today. So you can find a timestamp below the video to jump straight into the interview with Beth, or you can hang out with me in my studio for a little while and see what I'm working on. Uh, so I am actually making the next step. I'm taking the next step in my latest goddess quilt, and this is Eye of Calm, it's a pregnant goddess, and yeah, I'm really excited about this. I got really busy. I mean, we took an unexpected trip last week down to Pensacola, Florida for Josh's grandmother's memorial, and kind of all of, <laughs> all of my plans went out the window. But even before that, I'd been kind of hesitating to jump into this project. I had lots of other things going on. We've got the friendship quilt along going on. And I guess I was kind of making some excuses and not prioritizing this project. I was not putting it, making it the most important thing on my list. And there's a word that's popping up for me right now, and I think it's really important to share, and that is commit. Commit to this goal and commit to this desire. And yeah, you know, commit to it and be ready for the change that it brings. My word for the year is embrace change. Um, but embracing change means committing to making those changes happen. And I feel like I've been kind of, you know, I, I have the desire to have more children. If you have not heard my previous podcast episodes, this has kind of been a, a thing since the beginning of the year I shared this. Um, but yes, Josh and I are trying to have a new baby. And uh, at the same time though, and, and it's kind of going along with the theme of this goddess quilt, but at the same time, I've kind of been hesitating to take the steps that I need to take, such as contacting a midwife that I know and saying, hey, can, you know, are you available and would you service my area and all that kind of stuff. And I've just been kind of almost like standing on the edge of the diving board, but not yet ready to jump in. And and I was kind of making excuses, and I know it's so silly. I mean, it's not like contacting the midwife will suddenly make me pregnant, but <laughs> you know what, it's like, it's the mental thing. There's a lot of mental stuff here. Um, so I, I was thinking about that as we were driving back from Florida, and it started to really dawn on me, like, you know, I, I'm wanting this, but I'm, I haven't really yet committed to it. And a lot of that was, I just felt like there was so much on my plate. Uh, you know, I have been editing my challenge book. This is kind of, it ended up turning into more of a memoir style book, which was surprising to me. It ended up being about a lot of things I wasn't expecting. And right now Josh is actually editing it for me. And he was a little bit concerned and worried. He was like, I'm not sure I'm comfortable publishing this. And I've had to take a look at the book and do editing on my own. And now I'm at the point where I'm like, yeah, I really do want to publish this. I really do want this book to see the light of day. I really do want to share this with everyone. Um, a lot of surprising revelations came out of writing that book and many things will be changing <laughs> in my life. So uh, it's, been, it's been all good. All good things have come from writing that and giving myself permission to go there. Um, but in writing that and then also having Mally the Maker book two kind of on my plate too. And then I also want to dive right into my goddess book uh, on my goddess quilts. All of that together has just been making me feel like there's just too much going on and uh, how could I possibly have a baby on top of all of that? But I really, really want that too. And it's like, well, what do you want more? And yeah, I want that new person in my life more than anything. So uh, this morning I finally sent that email off to the midwife and it's like that word commit is 
beating a tattoo across my brain. And I am wholeheartedly committed to this path. And that's why I decided intro this podcast. I'm going to get take the next step on this goddess quilt. I cannot keep putting it off. I have got to commit to this path. And I'm so happy and excited because it's easy to get bogged down. Like I have all my silk has been pressed and ready to go, but it required this step, getting my freezer paper templates cut out, you know, prepared and cut out in order for me to take the next step. And I also have a lot of decisions to make about color and I've been feeling a little intimidated by it. I don't have a lot of colors to choose from with my silk collection. So I'm gonna just have to make the best of what I got and I'm not buying any more silk. I'm not buying any more fabric for this quilt. So yeah, I've been kind of mentally holding myself back. I've been, I've been standing on the edge of the diving board and unwilling to jump in. And this week I decided, yeah, we're diving in, we're going full bore. <laughs> we're not gonna stand on the edge and just wait and wait and wait and you know, cross my fingers that life will change around me when, before I'm truly ready to commit to it. And I think this is something I've done many times. You know, this is not the first time. I feel like for years I stood on the edge of that diving board waiting to commit to owning a business and waiting to commit to learning photography and wanting to become an author but not taking the first step to learning what that meant or how to do that. So this is not a single thing. You know, this is not the only time this has ever happened to me. And I'm very happy that I've experienced this before and I was able to recognize that kind of hesitating emotion and be able to, you know, kind of say, Leah, pull on your big girl panties and let's get on with it. And I already heard back from the midwife and she's super, super sweet. Um, and you know, I'm really, I really feel good about this. And I'm, you know, even if she can't come to Shelby, um, then I can always, it, this is like the first step to finding the right person to help us with this. And that feels really, really good. So I'm excited. We'll see where this goes. And now I have my freezer paper templates almost ready to go. Basically making this, um, I'll just give you a little bit of a preview of freezer paper piecing. You take freezer paper, mark your master pattern, then you double the freezer paper to create super, super thick templates. But to get the freezer paper really nicely pressed, you really need a firm pressing board, which I make my own pressing boards and I have a tutorial on that. You can find it at leahday.com press to learn how to make your own very firm pressing board. You need that. Uh, and you preferably need it about the size of your quilt. And I don't have one quite big enough for this one. This quilt's running about 20 by 40. Yeah, I think I limited the size to 40 inches because that's how wide my silk is. <laughs> I'm actually making this quilt specifically to use up this fabric. And yeah, that'll be a good thing. But it is kind of a, a little bit of a limitation, definitely. But I also look at this going, you know, this is about the size of the quilt that I want to take on right now. I don't really want to take on anything super, super huge uh, because then I have to quilt it and that'll take forever too. So yeah, this feels great. All right, so I have doubled up the freezer paper. That's what you just heard me pulling it up. And then now I just need to cut all of the pieces apart. But before I do that, I need to mark lines so that way I know how it all goes back together again. And this is the thing, you can kind of sort of see the lines of the goddess now. She's got a layer of freezer paper on top, but I need kind of hash marks uh, that will help me connect those pieces together as I'm piecing so that as I'm gluing uh, the pieces, I kind of overlap them and glue them together before I take them to the machine. I make sure that these hash marks line up perfectly and then I don't have to worry about getting to the machine and it not fitting quite right and ending up wonky. I also need to number them, otherwise I won't know <laughs> what, what anything is doing. Of course, it's good to have a numbering system of some sort, otherwise I'll end up cutting all of these pieces apart and then it will be like, oh, I don't know where anything goes. So yeah, this is gonna take a little while. So other news around the house, it has been definitely a week of catch up, not a big thing, not a bad thing at all, um, but I did kind of, end up scrambling to get block three finished and ready to go. And you can now find the pattern for block three, our tree of life block, kind of going along with the baby theme. <laughs> and also the bonus quilt pattern 
And here you go. I decided not to get it on the frame. Uh, last week I pinned the minky on and then I realized eh, I wanted to do something else on the frame first before I got to this, so I pulled it back off. But this is the, what ended up being gigantic quilt version of the same block. It's basically the supersized version, 78 inches square. However, if you don't want it that big, just don't attach the borders. <laughs> the center of the block ends up being, uh, I think it was 54 inches square. So you could just stop there and not add the extra borders and then it wouldn't be nearly as big. So yeah, you can find the Block 3 Tree of Life quilt pattern at leahday.com slash friendship. You can also find the first piecing tutorial, which I just posted this Monday, learn how to put it together. And it's funny, I actually stitched the first one slightly differently and then when I was reworking it for the pattern and stuff I realized you know what like I originally pieced tiny little squares for the background and pieced it all together and I was like why am I doing this <laughs> why cut out you know an additional I don't know it was at least it was over a dozen little background squares when I could do strips instead and so I altered the pattern to make that happen and I'm really happy I did you know it's an evolving process pattern making, you know, and, and anyone that designs patterns will tell you this, there's a million different ways that you can write it. And there's no single right or wrong way. But I am finding there's definitely faster methods. And I personally think faster is better, uh, particularly when, you know, I'm, I'm kind of gauging everybody's <laughs> length of time and how much time it's taking to cut these pieces. And I'm realizing, you know, that it is a pretty big commitment. I mean, it's 45 half square triangles to make the tree of life block. And that can be time consuming. And I mean, I don't think anything about it because I just come downstairs and that's what I'm doing all day. But when I'm hearing from quilters, especially on our Quilting Friends Club, I'm starting to pick up that, yeah, cutting out all these little pieces is taking quite a lot of time. And, uh, you know, and it's, and it's a commitment. It really is, particularly if you're doing the queen or the king size, it's two blocks a month. So it's that much more. <laughs> so yeah, I am working on that and trying to simplify just so that way it's, it's not an overwhelming um, amount of cutting. You know, I can minimize that as much as possible. Our block for next month, that's the uh, block for what's the next month after February? March. There we go. March. Uh, and that one is going to be square and a square units, which are a lot of fun. And that will probably piece up fast, except for the little one inch squares <laughs> that, that go around the border. You know, it's one of those things. Using up scraps is so much fun, but no one ever said it was fast. It is a bit on the time consuming side because, you know, we save all these scraps with the idea like, you know, let's be frugal. Let's not waste our fabric. But I, I personally never really added up that, wow, using scraps takes that much more time because each individual piece has to be cut down and fiddled with and get to the, you know, get it to the right size and all that good stuff. Not to be critical of it by any means, but it's just, I'm picking up that this is proving to be more of a challenge than a lot of members have expected. Not a bad thing, but using up scraps it's hard, you know? That's why we buy yardage. That's why we buy new fabric. I think a lot of the reasons why I go to something new is because it's just simply easier to cut. You know, it's easier to cut a whole strip of one and a half inch, you know, one and a half inch wide strip. And then from that cut lots of little one and a half inch squares. Uh, so if you are starting to feel bogged down, if you're feeling like, wow, this is just taking a lot of time, you know, maybe life has kind of gotten a little on the busy side, give yourself permission to cut from yardage or use a charm pack or you know, simplify it in some way that makes sense to you. And it's okay if the colors all match. You know, I think that having one or two blocks or even half the blocks super scrappy and half the blocks super you know, solids, you, know, you, could, you could pull this off with just one color of fabric A, that would be your, um, your kind of fo focal fabric for the tree, and then one fabric for your fabric B, the background, I think that would be fine. And I don't think that's going to stand out in some bad way on your quilt. So yeah, I'm just kind of picking up on all of these little things. And it's been, it's been really interesting. Uh, I got to say, 
I understand why Bonnie Hunter, she's a, an awesome scrap quilter and I, hi Bonnie, if she's listening, uh, you know, she is such an awesome person and I can understand why she put so much effort into cutting all of her scraps down into kind of pre-cut sizes and having them already ready to go in bins because that saves so much time, you know, pulling out pieces and getting things ready to go. That saves so much time because the cutting is already taken care of. So yeah, I, I can totally get that. I, before I was kind of like, why would you want to have a whole bin of two and a half inch squares? And now I get it. <laughs> when you need 45 half square triangles in a hurry, it makes sense to have stuff already pre-cut, already ready to go in set sizes. And it's a habit to get into more than anything else. Um, I will say that there are AccuQuilt go dies that can cut, I think there's six inch squares that will cut up and make one and a half inch squares. And they might have one that does two and a half inch squares. I need to check on that. Um, but I, I do believe that AccuQuilt has some good dies that can make this a little bit faster. Might not be the most efficient use of your fabric, but it might make the scrap cutting into smaller units go just a little bit quicker. Yeah, just things I'm thinking about more than anything else. And don't forget, you can join in the fun of the Friendship Quilt Along anytime. Just go to leahday.com slash friendship to learn more. That's where you can find all of the block patterns uh, that have been shared so far. This is a block of the month. And you can also find all of the tutorials that I've shared so far as well. And I have a video coming up on how to quilt the Tree of Life block on a home machine. That'll be next Monday. And then I'm gonna do a video on quilting with pantographs uh, on the big tree quilt. That'll be a lot of fun. Speaking of pantographs, they came in and I'm, I re I'm really excited about them and I would love for them to go up this week, but I can't even move the roll. Like this, there's this giant roll on the table and that's, I can kind of, no, I can't even like roll it over for you to see it because I've got my ironing board in the way. Let me see if I can shift things around here. So here is the first batch of pantographs that I have printed. I'm so excited about these, um, but they are tricky to understand how they work. And dad and I did a lot of fiddling and testing and playing, and I'm really excited about sharing some new tutorials on these. Uh, but I wanna do those tutorials before I put these up on the site, just so that you really understand how they work. Uh, and this is something that you use on a long arm frame. So you set it up on the back of the frame and you quilt from the back of the machine uh, and the pantograph guides your design. So you don't have to be thinking about it so much. You just use a laser light or a stylus on the back of the machine to trace the paper, paper drawing. And yeah, this is something fun I'm getting into. I'm really excited to play with them because it, it really is faster. It creates a super simple, pretty design. I did some daisies and some uh, loopy line and you know, just basically kind of started out with some simple stuff that I'm really excited to play with. And the one that I want to do for my tree of life quilt, let's see if I can find it. It's this curvy flowy chevron. Maybe you can see that. Um, yeah, and so it comes in this big giant roll really wide and I kind of look at that and go, my design that I want to quilt that quilt is right in the middle. So I said, I'm gonna just wait and let dad deal with that. He cuts it all apart, gets it all organized and then he spends the whole day folding them into the right shape. It's a lot of work, but uh, yeah, they're, I think they're gonna be really awesome thing to add to the site and I'm excited about it. So yeah, be looking for pantographs soon along with fun tutorials on how to use them. Cause it is the, it's not necessarily the following the pattern thing that's hard with pantographs. It's the indexing the quilt. It's moving the quilt. You basically quilt a row and then the moving of the quilt up to get to the next level and then keep the design continuous. That's the hard part. And we had a lot of fun thinking about it and, and coming up with some new ways of making that easier to understand and easier to do, no matter what size of machine or frame that you have. So that'll be a lot of fun. And I have Miss Bunny here. <laughs> she was uh, on top of my pantographs. And I just wanted to share it that I have now all of the tutorials shot from Miss Bunny. Her, you can 
learn how to make her at mallythemaker.com slash bunny. You can also learn how to make her dress. I did a separate video for the different back closure options for her dress, so you can learn how to attach Velcro, how to do snaps, and how to do buttons and buttonholes. And I had so much fun making all of these dresses. <laughs> This has just been such a fun adventure. And now out in the wood shop, I finally cleaned out my wood shop. Uh, I have a little um, wardrobe to keep all of her dresses in. I need to go put some uh, little feet on it. And then I had some balsa wood that I wanted to cut for doors. So yeah, I'm having a ball making Miss Bunny new little dresses and then keeping them all nicely organized in her little wardrobe. So that might be something I share in the future. I don't know. Uh, it's just been a lot of fun. I absolutely love her and everything. I haven't got everything posted yet. So be just looking forward to these new tutorials as they come out. Uh, those will be probably posted over the weekend, you know, here and there. And you can find all of them linked up together at mallythemaker.com slash bunny. And yeah, more dolls on the way. But as I said, I am kind of feeling like my plate is a bit full. So it felt like getting that all of those videos shot was just, it was kind of a big relief. It was like, Miss Bunny has been occupying some space in my crafty cottage, I gotta say. Like, all the different versions of her <laughs> have been uh, kind of floating around the crafty cottage. And in order to film something new, I kept having to kind of shove her off to the side. So the day that I shot the video for the Tree of Life piecing, I was like, all right, Miss Bunny, we're gonna get you dressed up. We're gonna get you finished here. And I just decided to go on ahead and knock all of that out and it felt good. It was, it was definitely time to get Miss Bunny back out of the crafty cottage. And then now I'm kind of going, wow, I have lots of versions of this doll. <laughs> so now I'm looking for little girls to give them to. And I have, of course, my nieces to give dolls to and a couple friends are having babies. So yeah, it feels good to be able to have, you know, a ready-made gift that's just ready to give. And I did get my spoon flower fabric. I kind of had this plan to do a cut and sew Miss Bunny out of fabric. I still need to test that. Again, time issue. Um, I still need to test that. It's on my list and I did some wild colors. So I'm gonna have a flaming Miss Bunny. She, uh, she'll have like a half red, half orange face with uh, I think red ears. Yeah, I did some crazy, crazy colors with that one, but I figured do something totally different for the spoon flower version and just see what works. Uh, I won't have a new Valentine's Day Miss Bunny done in time for Valentine's Day, but it is on my list. And, um, you know, I definitely have a goal of doing a, an Easter themed Miss Bunny. I'm thinking, you know, just to do some kind of special designs in her dress. Uh, maybe a row of Easter eggs around the hem. I don't know. I mean, it's just it's just fun to play with this and just see what I can do with it. Uh, and I have decided I'm going to push back the Mally doll until book two is out. And it's actually going to be a, a Mally doll and a boy doll. And I'm not going to tell you his name yet because uh, he's a special character in book two. And that way you'll be able to make both characters. And it's just, you know, pretty much the same doll, same doll shape, same everything. It's just, you know, different hair, obviously. And yeah, that'll be a lot of fun. And I just figured that'll take some pressure off of me. I was trying to work on that too on top of everything else and it was just too much. So I decided I'll wait on that until book two is ready to go. And my goal is still to get that out in 2019. That's what I said in the back of book one. I said, you know, do out 2019. I'm just going to have to speed up. I'm working through a new writing book. It's called The Snowflake Method of Writing. And it's been very, very helpful. So if you have thought about writing a book, or writing a novel, and you've just been kind of confused about the process, I really recommend this snowflake writing method. Um, it's, it's a very, it's very different from how I wrote book one. Uh, it's a different, out, it is an outlining method basically, but it's different from how I wrote book one and I'm really enjoying it because it forces you to kind of get into the head of every single character and understand their motivations and understand, you know, kind of their perspective and then it's forcing me also to kind of really work on the timeline and figure out what's happening when. And that way, you know, the bad guy is not, you know, off in his cave kind of going, I'm a bad guy and not doing anything. You, that's 
bad writing. So <laughs> that was really, really helpful. And it really helped me solidify some holes that I had in my plot uh, and make it a lot tighter and a lot better. And I'm really excited to get back to that. Uh, so I'm thinking I'm gonna move forward with dictation uh, that's speaking instead of writing by hand because I'm faster that way. And I'm just gonna get the rough draft out that way and then edit, edit, edit. Kind of when I do dictation that way, I have to commit to just, a, it's a slog of editing because dictation isn't of course perfect off speech, but it is a faster method to get the rough draft down. And it also is great on dialogue because of course I'm talking, then I am talking the way I would be talking. Instead of, you know, sometimes speech dialogue, when you write it by hand, it kind of, it doesn't work. Anyway, a anyway, little bit of writing stuff there, but I'm excited. I am definitely excited about all that's going on and all that I'm working on. I just wish there was more hours in the day more than anything else. Uh, now, last thing is of course our Quilting Friends Club. And I have to say a super thank you to everyone that has joined in so far. We are having a blast. I love seeing all of the beautiful friendship quilt along blocks as well as your beautiful quilts and hearing from different members, uh, you know, the struggles of being able to quilt our own quilts. And it's far reaching, you know, some members just are simply, you know, kind of struggling with time like me and some uh, physical issues and stuff like that can come up. And I just love having the supportive place to share and uh, to be able to see pretty photos and also to be able to share advice and quilting knowledge. It just feels amazing. And I should say that also this Quilting Friends Club helps support this podcast. It helps support all of my free tutorials online. So by joining in and paying just $2.99 a month or $24.99 a year, you're telling me that you really enjoy my work and you want it to continue. So a super special thank you to Cindy Wolf, Laura Bedzold, Karen March, Rose Rocker, Ann Mullis, Connie Bollard, Deborah Lehner, Kat Perez, Teresa Gobler, Geraldine Rupert, Jean Davidson, PC Reimer, Carol Bustos, Beth Pentrich, Christine Lewis, Barbara LaJoy, Elizabeth Hall, Cindy Hicks, Darla Gilbert, Karina Mize, Lorraine Bowman, Mary Hewitt, Christine Benzinger, Debbie Persillet, Susan Calhoun, Sousy, <laughs> Kelly Gill, Kathy Osborne, Laurie Saul, Kathleen Flett, Lean Lower, Jean, sorry, Jean Lower, Debbie Blessich. I sincerely appreciate all of you joining in the fun and I'm super excited for what the future brings. A uh, special bonus of joining the club is you get to see a video series that I've created called How Do I Quilt This? And you can share a photo of a quilt that you don't know how to quilt. And once a month, I take all of those photos and shoot a video and explain my ideas, you know, just different design ideas for the surface, whether it's quilted for show, whether it's quilted for a bed, or it's quilted for kind of an in-between. And I have a great time shooting this tutorial and members are loving it and learning a lot too. So I hope that you'll come and join in the fun, help support this podcast and all of the free things I share online. You can learn more at quiltfriends.club. And now it's time for our interview with Beth Moore Collins, all about fix it or forget it, how to fix the issues with your quilts and move on so you can finish it and enjoy your beautiful creation. Hello, my quilting friends. Today I'm here with Beth Collins. Welcome to the show, Beth. Hello, Leah. Now, a little introduction. Beth developed a business as an artist in her early 20s and did that for over 20 years. She taught people of all ages from 4 to 94 how to paint. Then she went back to school to get a degree in business, psychology, and art with a goal to graduate before her kids did and made it by one year at age 42. Now Beth uses that art and color theory experience to make her own textile art and quilts. And she's always felt that the prize is making people feel better about themselves. We all live for praise and recognition. And that fits perfectly with what we're talking about today. We're working through the issues that can crop up on our quilts uh, with the topic of fix it or forget it. So let's begin with that. What is your current quilting project, Beth? And uh, have you run into any snags, any problems along the way? Well, every year I start off with a long list of UFOs that carry over, like what I'm saying too, 
And some of them I weed out and pass along to other people because I decided I'm no longer interested in it. I've already mastered that skill, so I need to practice more on it. But then uh, this year, because I have a more of a background and a lot of a color, I love multicolored, everything colorful. <clears throat> so I just didn't make a quilt with no color. And for me, that's going to be really hard. So I'm only allowing myself to use the shades of black, like black to gray to white, and shades of brown, like chocolate brown to beige to cream. And I'm going to do a different, my focus for the year, its skill level is going to be different. And I'm going to start with a medallion. Since I did a couple of years ago, my focus was on precision piecing. I'm making, I'm making myself do harder blocks. So my center of my medallion is going to be a feathered star. Now, I don't know that it's there because I haven't even tried one yet, but it is. So I'm going to find out. <laughs> because if I'm, I'm going to go through this medallion and put a, a whole lot of intricate borders out and out and out and out uh, all around this medallion until I end up with like a big queen size quilt. So every time I do another row of borders, I'm going to try to make them kind of a, not really big old block, but little intricate, intricate pieces. I've got a giant stack of 200 little tiny like, geese sitting right by me. Wow. And, and the same thing with nine patches. Uh, that took some practice and vision painting to make all that work and make sure it's perfect. Absolutely. I can imagine. So uh, when you run into a quilting problem, it sounds like you're really excited about this particular project. But uh, let's talk about a, a project that maybe didn't turn out so well. Uh, what was like the first hint or first sign that something was just not going to work right with it? <laughs> Well, I'll tell you about one that has been finished, and then I took a class of yours and started last February, I don't even know why I didn't like it. And so I figured out after taking that Rainbow Log Cabin class, and my focus last year was on looking for the quilting, and I did finish my Rainbow Log Cabin. It's a long, tweet size. I was so proud that even though it's really scrappy, I had the whole thing finished by the end of February. And that was a, a lot of focusing on one thing. But um, that practice on that much walking foot quilting led me to believe when I walk by this quilt in the hall, I just would go, yuck. Or if somebody comes along and pays me a compliment on the quilt, I can have it. You know, one of those attitudes. Yeah. <laughs> and so over the summer, I took a trip, and my goal on the, in the car was to take out every stitch of quilting. And I, it's probably three foot by four foot. And I had quilted it myself, but it was long ago, and I didn't really know what I was doing, you know. Mm -hmm. All I can say was it held the three layers together, <laughs> yeah. uh, which is not my goal anymore. I'd like to try to be a little better than that and hope I keep growing. So uh, this is um, back in the days when we did watercolor quilts, which simply means that over one corner, all of these are little tiny one-inch squares, a whole thing. One card starts off in, on mine in black and then graduates to this more difficult bleed, blending section of six or eight inches till you get over to really light shades of the, on mine, it's the sky. So I've got all these little squares and it's all flowers from the particular fabric that I picked out. And so I added embroidered butterflies and spiders uh, to give it a little three dimensional bang. So then I got to thinking about the quilting, so I started with my spider, and I remembered how you did the, I don't remember the name of it, but we started in the middle of the quilt and made a line going all the way out like a sun, mm -hmm. um, that particular walking foot design. So I started at my spider, and I went to the top, to the bottom, to the left, to the right, and then kept filling in from there until I hit my border. But so that was just my center medallion. Then I decided to challenge myself with a better border. So I did, and I put my other corners in it. I reflected some good color. But I didn't put the spider out there. It wouldn't look right. So there I did walking foot quilting in a curve because now I'm out my butterflies. So I kind of did uh, the echo of clouds about half an inch apart all over the rest of the quilt. And so my outer border is six inches and it's kind of boring so after taking a class from Susan Cleveland and learning how to make 
two color prey points and two color yo yo's, I scattered some of that work along my soft border, which reflected my colorful garden, and I won the first prize ribbon on it. So nice. now I'm pretty happy with it. <laughs> nice, very nice. So it just felt a little too ho hum. Was that kind of the major issue with that quilt? Well, I looked at it and I was not satisfied with my sewing skill because it was puckering, it looked crooked. You know, sometimes we look at one and piecing's okay. One of those other steps, like like maybe I changed the borders on this too. So it, it just was didn't meet my new standards because now my standards are better than they used to be. Yeah, yeah. Now, do you think it's better to go back and fix something old or just to make something new? What's your opinion on that? That is a terrific question. Both people wouldn't bother to go back and fix something that they did a long time ago. And it, it definitely is easier to start from scratch because I could have just made a whole other medallion of something and then pieced it that way. But there was so much of it that I did like that I wanted to keep it. And another reason sometimes I back and improve an old one is because it has a sentimental value. Maybe I took a did it in a class that I loved. Maybe I did it at a convention when I started it. Or it might be who I made it, what who I was. There's a quilt I have that I did when my father died, and every time I look at it, it's my father's quilt, even though he wasn't even there, you know, it has a huge sentimental value. And so sometimes I'll fix something because it means a lot to me, even though the rest of the world care, I don't care if they care, but all that matters is that I think it's important. But then if I learn a new skill, I'll just start on the project. That makes a lot of sense. That really does. Um, so have you ever had a quilt that you needed to take a break from? I've, I've done this myself, and I'm just curious if other people have the same thing. Um, just kind of put it in a bin and be like, all right, we're going to have, we're going to, we're going to be broken up for a little while, and then I'll come back to you when I can. Have you ever done that? Exactly. Well, I think quilting is a love-hate relationship. Sometimes I love it, and sometimes I just hate it. <laughs> and it goes in and out through little spells. So, um. I think that that's a little bit about um, uh, why I put it away for a while. Um, sometimes it's just that I don't have the skill and education yet to do that step. Sometimes I've got something east and I have no clue how to. I, when I first started, I had no clue how to make the sandwich, so my little piece of tops would just sit around. Finally, somebody showed me what to do next. But um, I have this book um, that um, I started, gosh, I don't know, 10 or 20 years ago, and I call it. Fish, spelled P-H-S-H, and it is, instead of a landscape, it's a seascape, which means, in effect, it's a distant horizon of the close-up of the sea creatures down in the bottom of the quilt, then it goes to the middle of the ocean, and then in the distance is islands and sky. Well, I, I knew how to get the fish where I wanted them. I loved that I cut a lot of them out of, actually fish, out of fabric, and then some of them I just chop a piece of paper and you do a paper snowflake and dreamed up a, a jellyfish or something. <laughs> and that was fun. But um, so I had all this work on all this cutting and I did all this thread painting around them. I did a strata underneath, but I had no clue how I was going to the top of it. Because I was, so I was, I tried doing a strata for the sky, different colors, which is just a bunch of strips of fabric sewn together. So in intro, if last year I took off the fabric from the sky up, literally, I cut it off. No, I mean I didn't cut through. I already had it layered at that time. But um, so I took off the top part. I added a white piece of fabric, and then with my painting background, I knew, hey, I know how to do the sky, and I know how to do islands in the distance with little trees all over them. That's easy, real easy. I started painting, and I started with my sky in the middle, and got darker and brighter, and made the hills look real pale, and, and it just really added that pizzazz that I was looking for in this project. So, um, one of my um, things that I help students with is that there's so many little tips you can do to improve it, even if I don't have to go back and sew it. I can change the value. I can change the Scott's eye without doing the whole quilt over. And sometimes it's just with a little paint. And I think it's kind of a magic to quilting. 
Absolutely. I completely agree. What's that your favorite type of fabric paint to use? At, um, well, I use lots of different kinds of acrylics, but I, I don't really use dyes because I don't have any. I've used crayons a lot and a brand called Decal Art, and they make a product called So Soft Fabric Paint, and it is as it says. But I also can use any of those little jar acrylics that they sell at the craft stores and mix it with a product that's on the shelf by them, but most people don't to look for it, and it's just called Fabric Medium. And it's thick water. So when I'm loading my brush, I dip my brush in that to paint on my brush mm-hmm. and blot it on a paper towel and pad, and then I'm ready to go, and it will flow easier. And it, it acts and behaves and washes just like a fabric paint would. And you can mix any kind of acrylic paint. Cool. That saves a lot of money. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Because fabric paints are generally a little bit more pricey than the, you know, than the plain old Jane acrylics. Uh, so that's good to know. And, and you don't have, and unless you know a whole lot about how to mix colors together equal a different color, there's, you don't want to buy a million colors because yeah. they're too expensive. So if you're in those little craft yards, they've got every color in the world already there for you. <laughs> exactly. So you just need to mix it with fabric medium. That's great. Okay. Mm-hmm. Um, so you teach students and you help uh, other students and quilters come, kind of fix their quilting mistakes. What is the number one thing you would say that your students struggle with? Of color. Yeah. You know, it's, it's always color. And, um, I mean, there's, I teach the skills too, you know, like the sewing and the boards and mitering and all that. But I can't tell you how many times somebody, if I'm with somebody, they'll say, would you please go shopping with me? <laughs> and I, and because they have no clue how to make this star in their complicated, look like a star. Because if it doesn't have the right colors behind that star or in sewing adjacent, sewn on next to it, you, it gets lost. And this recently I had a student who actually she was doing a medallion and it, she wanted the look of a big star and then a little star in the middle of that. But all her colors were medium values. Well, you know what happened. It was just one piece of mud. When you mix all colors together in paint, you get brown. Well, when you mix all these same likeness and this right down the middle value and quilt it, nothing shows up when you stand across the room. So we went shopping and we added dark darks and we added light lights and kept her favorite colors. And it just popped. It worked so easy after that. So having with, with colors is a big thing. But there is another story I'd like to share. I had a friend who didn't live here at that time. And sometimes people walk into a store with a pattern or a block that haven't listened to someone like you to get any kind of quilt education. And they just dive in and they realize it's not setting them up for success because you can't start at high school before you've gone to kindergarten, in my opinion. <laughs> <laughs> so that's why I just love all the podcasts and the tutorials. I did that 365 year. So it's put out. I love that. So she went in with a king size blocks for 12, supposed to be 12 inches. She didn't even know what a quarter inch meant. She had no idea until six months into it what a quarter inch foot is. And I just can't believe she did all that sewing and never quit. So, but then she got, then she moved here and had some stacks of blocks and she said, Beth, I don't know what to do. None of them will fit together. She was right. So we had a day laying them out. These are too little. It can make do. And this stack is too big. And we're talking too big. We mean like an you know, inch and a quarter too big. All wow. Over. That's a lot on a 12 inch block. And then the little ones, that I helped her sort was, okay, some of these seams are going to have to be unsewed because your seam is like over three-eighths of an inch, and we're just going to have to take some of the uh, it worked, of course. Because the fabric was already there uh, in the seam allowance. So I usually always give my students homework because then I know they're serious, and they can't learn just by watching me. They have to really do something. It's kind of like, you can't exercise by watching TV. It doesn't work on the box that way. <laughs> yes, exactly. <laughs> you really have to practice the emotion. I just can't keep watching you forever. <laughs> so, yeah. um, so her homework was to um, take apart certain ones and let the things out. And then on, and then the middle ones, we did the pin it to uh, an ironing surface um, and 
pinned it. Actually, what I'd do is draw square on the ironing surface, like on a scrap fabric, and then I make I pin every corner in the right place, and then we wet it with spray starch and we ooch it in. If you, especially if it's only got half an inch too big, and I can ooch that in with a whole lot of pins and steam it and push it, and it will suck that extra fabric in and it works out perfect. And you can't tell once you get it quilted that it behaves this great. Yeah. But I've I uh, have even done those clear up to at, at least an inch and a quarter too big. That's really not all that hard. Mm-hmm. You just have to use a lot of pens and, and don't let it get skewed. All the lines got to be straight, you know. Mm-hmm. By drawing that square on my iron surface, that is a big help because I know it's got to stay in that line. Sure. Uh, so anyway, we got, we've got all the hooks to behave, and then when she started to sew them together, they worked. And I was, gosh, she was almost through by then because it was the rocks were ready to go. And then she went to that stage where she hated the quilt, like we were talking about at first. And she did, and so when she put the binding on, she was so sick of it, she just slapped it on. And I mean, it was only caught like halfway down on the, on the binding in some places. So in case, I just, I just couldn't let this quilt live like that. So I literally took her binding off and redid the binding for her. So that, uh, sometimes we save a friend's quilt. You know, and because she was just sick of it by then. <laughs> but now she keeps it, and there's a whole lot of corners that are cut off and piecing, and she's aware of it. But she's so proud that she didn't give up. And that's that's how I feel, too, because it was her very first. You know, like I said, sometimes it's a sentimental reason that we want to save something. Mm-hmm. Yeah, definitely. So you, you, you want to hear about my Christmas quilt? Yes. Let me, let me tell you about that. This is a example where somebody else had a UFO. Actually, my girlfriend had her sewing room set up. She had this Texas Santa Claus wearing a cowboy hat and um, a shirt and pants, and then he's holding a roping, a Christmas tree, but the Christmas tree is really a goat cactus. And above that it says, Merry Christmas, y'all, with a couple of cowboy boots. <laughs> I live on a ranch. My guy's a cowboy. And so, oh, I just fell in love with it. And it, I just went over there and waved over I said, oh, how darling, this is so cute. I need a one of those. And she said, well, here, you can just have it. She threw it at me. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not kidding. <laughs> so, this, uh, so it took, I just worked it on little bits and pieces. But a year later, I actually entered that in a quilt and won first place on it. Nice. And I did enter it as a group quilt because she definitely had it started, you know. And so, that was certainly fair. But, um. Or some of her piecing didn't work. I had one inch saw a jar of yo-yos ready to go because that's a real easy take-along project. So I had whole hundreds of yo-yos on all the seams. Now I have a red yo-yo and a green yo-yo sewn down on all of her piecing. Didn't look so good. So that worked out cute, like a big accent. I had two friends that had blocks like Pinwheel and Nine Patch that I had inherited after the passing, and I was just happened to be in those colors, red and green. So I thought, okay, I'm going to gather all my leftover orphan things that are red and green. I'm going to try to put them somewhere in this quilt. So I undid a couple of the straight seams that she had left under the banner and added a row of pinwheels and put little presents under the cactus tree that were really intricate pieced blocks. And uh, I think it worked out really cute. Oh, but the cutest thing is I went shopping at the used clothing store. Nice. And you know how cow shirts have buttons that are snaps on the front, and they're really good ones for pearl buttons. And then that's a very Western look. They're on the cuff and in the front. And then, the, of course, you got to have blue jeans if you're a cowboy. So I bought a plaid shirt in a kid size that has pearl buttons, and I bought a little teeny weeny pair of, I don't know, size one or something, blue jeans or faded, and I literally cut those out and made enough uh, inventions in placement of fabric, like, you know, it's kind of 3D, it sticks out now and then, so that i got three showing, i got the cups on the sleeve showing, got one hand in the pocket, and the hand that's raising in the air that has the rope in it, one for the tree, I have a friend's old leather work glove. Oh. On his hand. Really, it was a real glove, and the real blue jeans are on there. I found an old belt and put it on the uh, through the blue jean loops. So now I have this Texas Santa that says "Merry Christmas, y'all," and 
and the friend, I didn't let the friend see it till the end of the year when I had it off. And then in our group here, we did show and tell. And she just had a fit when she saw how changed it was. Yeah. I have a real beard on it. And he has Holly on his hat band. And uh, real fur from doll hair. That worked out really good. And a real handkerchief. So, um, I even have a friend who's a quilter who's a re- just retired as a sheriff, a lady. And she let me have one of her pins to put on his uh, star. Huh. So that made it even more sentimental to me. So you just never know how these quilts are going to tell our story. Absolutely. Absolutely. And that sounds so cool that you incorporated so many real things into the Santa Claus and got it all to fit. I've done that one time with a little, it was like a little art quilt that I used a piece of my son's shirt in when he was like a toddler. Mm -hmm. And it was so much fun. I think we should absolutely do that more, you know, to incorporate real clothing elements and, and like applique. Was that kind of how you did it? An applique stitch in order to secure everything down? Yes. Uh huh. I had to like, almost like you're sewing on a button in the middle of the shirt to gather up some of that poofiness. Yeah. Because I had to squash the shirt in, you know. And so I gave myself permission to chop up the shirt wherever I had too much fabric. Like, the sleeve couldn't possibly be the whole thing. So I just cut out the back. I just used the parts that made it work on the quilt. I threw the rest of it in the trash, you know. So, yeah. yeah it just, it really, it really wasn't that hard. Sure, sure. That sounds so neat. So what would you say is like the most radical change you've ever made to a quilt? And I've, this is just some examples that I've heard from art, from, from taking a painting and fixing a painting. Uh, I heard of one person that uh, actually slashed the canvas into pieces and then put the pieces back together again. And then another person just takes the fl- canvas and flips it upside down and then goes from there and says, that's the new up. Um, have you ever done that with a quilt? <laughs> Well, I hate to say it, but I had a little granddaughter that did that with a pair of scissors. Oh, no. To three of them. And it just happens that all three were the same color scheme. But obviously she was little, and uh, it was 2 o'clock in the middle of the night, so mother didn't know it. And she had a friend over. So you could just see the little evil thoughts going on. They wanted to sew. So I decided to sew by popping up three of my clothes. So that is in progress, and I don't love it enough yet to have finished it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So I will. We will need to get back to the finished product and see now you just made a new challenge. I need to finish that. Yeah, <laughs> that's another reason to put back together something that got sliced up. You know. Yeah. And I and I I think it's going to be kind of fun. It'll just be fractured, and they just happen to be all in the same color scheme. So it's going to work great. So as you can see, I've kind of got the design part figured out and the planning. And that's sometimes the hardest part when you're correcting. It's getting it in my head. How am I going to correct this? I'm going to make something out of this otherwise pile of trash, you know? Yeah, yeah. No, I completely agree. I completely agree. And it's it's really interesting that you say that because sometimes, uh, and I don't know if this ever happens to you, like I'll have in my mind what I want to do. And then if I take too much time to get to it, like I just pause, I'm too busy, you know, whatever, I lose it, and then it's I I can't get back to it. Does that happen to you? Yes, it can flip right out of, it's kind of like an image in our head that we have filed, and if I don't draw a sketch, make some notes, uh, something like that, it, uh, I, it's really easy to lose it. But I'd rather go ahead and get those notes and, sk- and, you know, like we kind of have a journal. Yeah. So I'll write some notes down in there, and that'll help me get, like the fish quilt, I did exactly that way. Because I had all, all these fish cut out. I bet there's 500 fish on this four-by-five-foot quilt. <laughs> wow. And I had all done, but I was unhappy with it. And uh, it just got filed away at that stage in my head. But it, fortunately, you know, we shouldn't throw those things away if they're really important to us. And, and I always keep all the bits and pieces like yeah. I used, or if I knew, like I was gathering up things for this Texas Santa. I wasn't sure exactly all of it I was going to use, different dimensions of rope, different kinds of fringe to go on the cactus, but I did keep it all together. And that really helps me get it out later and say, oh, yeah, I remember I was going to use that glove. Yeah. That's, I think that's a good tip. Keep, keep all of your parts, keep it in that bag, write a few notes, 
and give myself permission to just go let rest. Sometimes every year. Yeah. But it's still in the back of my mind, and it's still on my UFO list, which I do write every January. <laughs> and I love marking things off of that list. Oh, I bet. And it's so satisfying. <laughs> so how many quilts are on that list right now? It's January, so we, I, 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 well, almost February. So I guess that you've already been knocking a few things off the list? Yes, I have. Um, there's, I've, I've just almost got all my um, really important projects finished. So I only have about eight. But I always keep at least six. And that's not, and that is on purpose. So I'm not saying that it's a UFO because I just don't have time or I hate it. It's because I like to work where, uh, and I have to admit, I'm blessed where I'm not sewing at my kitchen table. Yeah. So that definitely makes my world different. And I've, I certainly can appreciate that because I've been there. But I like having a, I'll keep my bigger machine in. I'm going to keep my old one because you don't get any money for it anyhow. So maybe I'll keep that machine, and it's got black thread on it. And that's a UFO that I'm working in black, and maybe I'm just piecing, but it's not precision. And so that is what I start at when I come to my sewing room. I always start on something that is less challenging, not as precision, not too much to it and I can just kind of breathe through it with that kind of an attitude. Maybe it's a skill level I've already studied and I'm better at it so I don't have to concentrate so much. So I'll keep a project at that level. I'll keep another project that I'm just in the middle of cutting. And I'll keep another project maybe over there at my ironing station because I start now I need to iron all this stuff. Well that's a totally different project. But that's just me. A lot of people like to do one thing at a time and I think they should do whatever works. I I don't think it's really me getting distracted. Since I'm older, I like using different body parts instead of at a machine for eight hours. I like to have something I can stand up and walk to my ironing board and go stand up and iron for an hour. And it works. I get more done at the end of the sewing time because I'm not sore. My neck and her shoulders are hurting. I'm careful to do some sitting, some standing, some walking around, you know. And so those UFOs are, are kind of a, my plan. I, I don't have them there because I was too lazy to finish it or I didn't know how to finish it. It's If I finish one of them, I start a new one because I like to have about five or six going. Yeah, and that makes so, total sense to me. I think... I think we should all work in systems and a system meaning, um, you know, you find what works really well for you that allows you to be the most efficient at what you're doing. And it sounds like you've done that mm-hmm. where you kind of have different stations set up throughout your room and, and then you have a different project at each station. So when, you know, kind of like whatever you're pressing is done pressing, you know, it's ready to move to the next station, whatever is there needs to mm-hmm. move to the next one and so forth. I think that's a really good way of doing it. Uh, I kind of almost do this something similar between, you know, how I prep in the house and then go out to the crafty cottage to actually film. And it's really funny. I, I, I can totally relate with you saying that you want to have like black thread on one machine. Uh, you know, sometimes I'm feeling so lazy that I'm like, I don't want to bother rethreading the machine. <laughs> so I'll go downstairs just so I don't have to rethread it. So, yeah, I completely relate to that. Cool. So uh, yeah, sometimes it's a day of just winding a few bobbins for 30 minutes because okay, I don't want to get in the middle of that project and have the bob out right in the middle of this walking foot thing, for example. Yeah. So, and that's okay. It's just, it's just part of this process. Absolutely. So tell me about how you deal with issues that crop up after a quilt's been completed. So have you ever had like uh, batting beard and leak through or something like that? Like what do you do if a quilt shows up a problem after you're you're done with it it's been being used you've been enjoying it what do you do then (laughs) okay here's a good for you i call this quilt rubies and gold um because it's made in vibrant uh garnet shades of red like the stone ruby and uh gold colors like fall uh and so this quilt is like 130 inches by 130 inches. Whoa. It's crazy big. I know. It's crazy big. And it's got, between all the blocks, are over 12 inches big. And I, I, it is an original design, but the inner blocks are from traditional blocks, you know, just uh-huh. blocks we've all studied and through history. But then I created my own border, but instead of having a border, I made a 12-inch block, and I made them all 
kind of have a dash dyed on a line across through them by the of the fabric. And so all my edges are that big red block and then a gold stashing. That big red block and gold stashing all the way around the thing. So it kind of serves as a border, but it's box size. Yeah. So that's the first time I've ever done that before, and it worked out terrific. It was also really cool to quilt it that way. But the problem was I hung it over the banisters, went outside, walked way back, looked at this thing flying in the wind, and I hated the placement of my blocks. So this was before I did that arrangement. I was trying to do a barn raising first. You know how you can arrange blocks millions of ways. So without boring you, I did it three different times. I put all those blocks together, and it's that big. (laughs) Oh my that gosh! Is crazy. That is enormous. <laughs> I know, and that one has really gotten me uh, a reputation for perseverance. <laughs> and I didn't want to get up because I liked it. I, I like the quilt, and it matches everything in that room goes in. But so then I finally got it all done, and I liked the arrangement. And one other time I pieced it because it was too dang long. And so I had to go rearrange all the blocks because I wasn't happy with how it fit on the bed. So anyway, uh, this time I'm really picky about the color definition of can I see that basic line in that traditional block. Let's do a pinwheel. Does it look like a pinwheel or does it look like a star or is it a blob of one color because there's no contrast? That happens so often especially uh, with people who need a little more help with, with learning about value. But I'm really picky about it because I want my value to be just right. So I was totally finished with the quilt and unhappy that some of the blocks didn't have enough contrast in them. So I got out my trusty little paintbrush and I looked at that little triangle in that block. It's not a pinwheel. Let's say it was a pinwheel block. So I wet it with a little water and I got my paintbrush out. And this is already quilted. And I put it, my paint all over it. And it worked wonderful. It just did the charm. Perfect. Yeah, so for me, that was the easy fix because I'm not scared. I knew that my paint wouldn't bleed to the end, to the other side, because I had the confidence to know how the paint would behave. But that's a perfect way to help people. Sometimes it's just five minutes worth of a little effort, and you just love it. Exactly. So now I'm happy with it. Perfect. I love that idea. And I have also taken paint to a fully finished quilt. And it is terrifying, but at the same time, it's also really thrilling to see that bloom of color, that get a totally different effect, and and to have totally that different. much control. Now, my issue is I always get to that stage, and I'm like, all of my limiting voices of, I'm not a painter, you know, I'm not an artist, kind of start <laughs> cropping up. So I have to kind of work through that process as I'm sitting there putting paint on the quilt. So I completely understand where you're coming from with that. And I love that idea, too. I think if a student was going to try something like that, if they would just get out, the, you know how we used to address the block? Don't do that too much anymore. But if they would just kind of sketch out that block and even use crayons and color it in and then change that area that they don't like to the color they do like so that they can set it across the room, step back, do you like it a lot better? Well, then it's going to work on the quilt too. Exactly. Just practice somewhere else. Or even someone doesn't block like that if it's that important. Just It's not that hard to do. It actually wouldn't have to sew it, would you? You could just... uh, Glue them to a piece of cardboard, the fabric, and then paint on those. Yep, absolutely. There's always a way to practice. Yeah, and I think... I love your advice about stepping back from the quilt and getting a different perspective of it. I really think that that needs to be a habit. Um, I hang quilts on my dining room wall and just live with them on the wall for a little while, sometimes in a very unfinished state. And I think just taking that time to stare at it unfinished is really a good habit to build. Do you do that as well? Do you have a design wall? I tell people to live with it. Yeah. I say live with it. Go away. Even if you have to just put it somewhere where you can walk back in a couple of days later. And that's with any kind of art. Or even when you're rearranging furniture, anything I'm designing, go up brain rest. In the meantime, it's wonderful how the back of my brain does its homework. And it'll start visualizing, well, if I put this over here, that over there, or change this to a darker red, or that to a different shade, and I come back and try it, it works. But um, sometimes I think we just need to let uh, the rest of our brain do our work for us. You know, they used to say, just sleep on it overnight before you make your mind up. Just, exactly. just, sleep, just sleep on it. 
Yeah, I think that's perfect advice. So here's the question I always ask everyone at the end of our podcast episodes. Uh, What are you most looking forward to in the next five years? Are you planning on doing lots more UFOs or fixing quilts? Or is there something else on the horizon for you, Beth? Well, I would say that I just love to teach. So to really, as far as that goes, I'd love to do more teaching. And I have all this background of teaching painting and it, you'd be surprised how much it, there those um design rules and color rules so apply to everything it doesn't matter if it's fabric or paintbrush or uh being a home decorator I, I like that part of it so that leads me to think that i've kind of in the middle of that stage where you move away from traditional blocks and borders it where I start doing designing my own more. And but that doesn't mean I stop doing traditional. Like this medallion quilt, Feather Star, that's as traditional as you can get because it's back from like the eighteen twenties. Mm-hmm. And it, it's, it has a reputation for being a more advanced piecing, uh, which is why I'm challenging myself to so I'm I want to do that project to continue my lesson and precision piecing, but when I do all that, I'm going to have to pick my own color placement. Well, if I don't pick my color placement, I'm not going to get a feathered star. So that'll be great practice for many things. And I, that's my challenge this year as far as when last year the quilting, which I loved the year with you, and my rainbow quilt and the big one we did, and that was wonderful just for that. So, um, as I go with these new skills, I have to remember, but don't know ones. I've still got to go regularly do a little pre-motion and those things because they still they stay in there. Absolutely. You can't just put on the back burner for six months. Exactly. So I'll, I'll start at least two or three new ones every year. And, and I'll, I don't care how many of those finish unless I'm doing it for a certain show. And, but I, every January, I pick another skill certain thing uh, um, so this year it's going to be better borders uh, every time I put another border around this medallion I'm going to make myself really stretch and make something about it not just being a plain old big nine patch and as I was helping judge at some big shows that was the most common comment that I heard from these professional judges and I think I agree so much because they would say something like, look how this person worked so hard about the middle third of the quilt. Now look about the next one third going out from the center. Hmm, okay, it's getting bigger, but it's got a little less complicated. And by the time I get to the edge, she said, I can tell they're just slapping on a border to call it finished, and much less anything good about binding. Uh, so I want to keep working on my borders so that I – and take that lesson, and as I do these other pieces, uh, even if they're like my original middle or from sentimental fabric in the middle, when I get to those borders, I want to keep just as much as enthusiasm as I did in the beginning. And that's a pretty big challenge. That is a big challenge. That definitely is. And and I, I know I'm personally guilty for just like, all right, I'm, I'm done with the middle. <laughs> Let's just make it big enough with a nice right. empty border and then be done with it. So I completely understand. And that is a great challenge to take on because you're right. That's, you know, that can be anywhere from an extra third to a quarter to even half the quilt, depending on how wide the border is. So excellent. Exactly. Thank you. And that's part of the reason I give myself permission to put one away. If I'm at that stage and I love this part of it, but I dread the rest of it, then I'll just go let it sleep for a while. Absolutely. So I shouldn't work on it until to give it my best. Absolutely. Well, thank you so much for being on the show, Beth. This has been delightful. Why don't you let everybody know where they can find you online and check out, uh, maybe see, come and take a class with you. Okay. Um, they can find me on Instagram at Quilt Instinct. And the same thing on Flickr at Quilt Instinct. And uh, I have about 100 pictures of quilts on there, both of those. And then in Pinterest, I am B. And there is a very organized 25,000 pins. Wow. Very organized. And there's a, I know, there's a folder called Best Quilts. And that's where I'll be posting more of uh, what we're talking about. So hopefully between all those, somebody can find me. 
Absolutely. So just to reiterate that, that's at Quilt Instinct on both Flickr and Instagram and B Collins on Pinterest. Thank you again for being on the show, Beth. This was so much fun. Thank you. I welcome you back to my studio and I'll show you around some more. <laughs> Excellent.